been a long time since I've done this. What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own Dynasty show. As always, I'm joined by my man, Mike, at Mike Me Up on Twitter. You look like you just popped out the trunk of a hangover movie right now. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Nick said he wanted, he wanted shirts off this, this, uh, this episode. We're doing shirts off. No shirts. You can see I got my freaking like t-shirt tan going on here. I've been out in the sun, uh, chilling all weekend. Uh, just got back. Um, so now I'm, you know, sitting here dropping about to drop some big motherfucking facts on all of you guys. So, so make sure you pay attention. Yeah. I was on the edge of my seat trying to come out my shirt, but I, I figured the headband was enough for you guys. Maybe the gold chain might do something to you. I got a real bad tan line too. So I'm not going to expose that, but Nick was not able to make this episode, which was kind of, a sad time because we're kind of transitioning a little bit more towards redraft type of content. This is still a predominantly dynasty show, but we figured as redraft leagues start to come around, we might as well hit on rookies that we like for redraft leagues because obviously if they do well in their rookie year, people are going to want them in their dynasty leagues as well. So this episode is going to be rookie players that we want to draft for redraft and in turn are probably going to spike in terms of dynasty value. Next week, we're going to do fade. So we're going to start talking about T Higgins and all those other frauds. So Without further ado, got your goddamn mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hit that intro. All right. So this week, we're going to get it big. And the reason why we're doing redraft is not because we're converting from a dynasty show to a redraft show. The reason why is because right now is redraft season. So we want to make sure we hit you guys with some good redraft facts. That's basically a lot of the drafts that are coming up. And two, we want to convert some of you guys that are playing redraft, you know, that have not tried dynasty to give us a chance to give that format a chance. I promise you, I promise you this. If you fucking go into dynasty, just like my shirt is on the ground, you will never go back. And I will stay shirtless this entire goddamn episode just for you guys. Entertainment value. Uh, so if we get some people to convert. You might have to do the rest of these shows without a shirt. Mike. <laughs> That's a big promise, but you yeah. might have to live up to it. If we get enough likes, if we get enough thumbs up. I will be, I will be shirtless for the rest of this fucking season <laughs> if I have to. Um, all right, guys, we're going to kick it off and you know, we're still going to give you guys a little bit of dynasty insight, but we're going to, we're going to lead in with some of the redraft takes. All right. So again, even in redraft, we don't play one quarterback. We play super flex only. So to kick it off, Mr. Joey Burrow. All right. Joey Burrow is going as the overall 59th pick. Again, a lot of this ADP is going to come from Fantasy Mojo, which is from the FFPC uh, Real Money League. So probably, in my opinion, the best redraft ADP out there. Because again, yeah, it's, it's still not, not perfect because like Damian Williams is still being picked there. And a lot of guys that have decided to opt out are being picked. But this is basically as good as it gets for right now. Yeah, it's because it's from the last month. So you're going to have some stale data in there. But, you know, it's as good as it gets. It's, mo- it's way better than Mox. Either way, you slice it. So <laughs> um, so he's going in the 59th overall pick at round five. Positional ADP QB 18. Now we looked at and compare that to his dynasty ADP where he's going 31st overall. In the third round as the QB8. So a 10 gap pick. Um, so Noah, you dropped him on here and I, I really agree and I really like this take, but I'm gonna let you kick it off for why you think Joe Burrow needs to be on your redraft teams. Mike, I'm gonna pull your own card against you. You always say fantasy football does not have to be hard. And you look at this situation and it's one of the easiest things to analyze. The Cincinnati Bengals fucking stink. They have no defense and they're in a division where they're gonna be down a ton. That isn't always a great thing because when you're playing against the Ravens and the Steelers, they're just going to f*** you up the ass and run it 100 times and the clock's going to run out. But you look at what Andy Dalton did last year, despite being on a team that stinks with no offensive line and his wide receiver one was Tyler Boyd and had basically nothing behind that. Like you think about their weapons last year, AJ Green was hurt. Auden Tate got like crushed at the end of the season. He couldn't finish the year. Tyler Eifert, I'm not sure that guy's ever even laced up a pair of cleats in his life. That guy hasn't played in forever. He had nobody to throw to, and despite that, among all quarterbacks who played at least 10 games, Andy Dalton was the QB 16 on a point-per-game basis. He did that without running the ball, without having much of an arm, and having nobody to throw to. Now he has A.J. Green back in the fold. What that means is at least there's another warm body on the outside that has at least decent enough hands to catch a pass. Last year, they didn't have that. They had, like, Alexander Leif Erickson and a bunch of other frauds. They also bring in Tiddy Higgins, who isn't our favorite guy, but at least – that gives you insurance if 
A.J. Green gets hurt, they have another big body receiver to win on the outside. Tyler Boyd is somebody we still like. And Joe Mixon, we've been praying on him. Opposite of T. Grizzly, like, you've been praying on my downfall. We've been praying on his come up to catch like more than 34 passes in a season. Hasn't happened yet. Maybe this is the year. Hopefully Zach Taylor, former president of the United States, can instill that in this offense. But what Joe Burrow has is a ton of weapons in a situation where they're going to have to throw. Last year, they were the sixth. They had the sixth most pass attempts per game in the NFL at 38 and a half. And that also takes into account the fact that Ryan Finley was playing games. And you usually don't want guys like Ryan Finley throwing the ball. Guess what? He kind of had to. But he was, like, thrown under the bus. They were still doing well. On top of that, Joe Burrow can run the ball very well. He had 399 and 368 rushing yards over his past two seasons at LSU, which are very good numbers. It was kind of just shy of what Daniel Jones did at Duke. And we all know that Daniel Jones was very good last season because, number one, he turned the ball over a lot, so he had a bunch more opportunities to get the ball back and then play from behind, which hopefully Joe Burrow isn't as turnover prone. But he also had a high floor because of his rushing upside. Joe Burrow brings that to the table. We saw it in college. We don't know what his 40 time is, but I think any rational human, anybody with two eyes, can see that when you outrun Isaiah Simmons to the sideline who ran like a 4-3-9, you got to be decently quick. And I think the fact that their offensive line isn't great is going to either open up our opportunities for dump offs to Joe Mixon, who is good after the catch, or ability to scramble, which gives you a high floor. So what I look for in a QB2, which is the range that Joe Burrow is going in, is somebody that has either a ton of passing volume or is a good runner of the ball. And in this case, he's both. He's basically just a better version and a more hopefully consistent version of Gardner Minshew. And if you get that quarterback 18, like 59th overall, I'm smashing the buy button every single day of the week because when you look at other quarterbacks even ahead of him, like Aaron Rodgers, what is he at this point of his career? He's just the throwing portion of Joe Burrow. He's another, like Joe Burrow is also a discount Daniel Jones. So I'll just take the discount in Joe Burrow, pass on a guy like Ryan Tannehill or just stack on Tannehill and Burrow and get a great QB1, QB2 combo for the entire season. And there's nobody that's going to steal his job. So he has really good job security. He just has to stay healthy and he's going to be probably a fringe quarterback one for you this entire season. Yeah, dude, I totally agree. I think, you know, Burrow, when you're looking for those, like, rookie quarterbacks, you do not want a pure pocket passer, right? Because, like, you want guys that can create on the run, create on the go, and Joe Burrow has it. I mean, the craziest stat still to this day that I remember Noah telling me is Joe Burrow had more broken tackles than Joshua Kelly. So, does that mean Joshua Kelly? I hate this. I hate the fact that your favorite stat about me is me disparaging a player the Chargers ended up picking. <laughs> I'm not a fan of that at all. <laughs> but it's just it's just big facts, man. I mean, it, it's big facts, and, and I love that stat a lot. And, you know, when you look at his tape, like, he was pretty goddamn sneaky, and people use sneaky fast to describe white guys who can run. And it's not that Joe Burrow's fast. I think he's just, like, he's pretty elusive, and he has really, really good pocket awareness. Like, he knows where to go. So he can get those. He's not going to break a run and get, like, 50 yards in the NFL, right? It's not going to happen. But he's, like, sneaky enough to kind of, like, navigate uh, where he is in the pocket to, to, like, get those five, six, seven yards, maybe sneak for a touchdown here and there. That's exactly what you need. But the, the fact of the matter is, like, this, this offense is going to be a high-volume offense passing offense right they're they're going to be trailing um but they also have a lot of weapons on offense man you got aj green i know people think he's washed uh you got tyler boyd you got my boy titty higgins titty higgins love that man okay titty higgins oh my and you got you got joe mixon as well coming out of the backfield hopefully they involve in the passing game look he's got a lot of weapons right and you know they got a little bit of bump to the offensive line so i i think that at a qb 18 price I feel like he's like a pretty good investment to make uh, in redraft. And, and, you know, for me, I never go early QB. So like having, having that late round QB um, is, is pretty fitting for me, I think in the super flex mode, like you're getting him in the fifth round. So I don't think there's like too much better value there. Um, so that's why I'm with you. I actually think that this is a really good pick. Um, and it's someone that I'm willing to both buy in dynasty and in redraft and that that's the beauty of it right you know we talked a little bit about his dynasty adp he's going as a qb8 pretty pricey when you when you think about just the raw numbers but when you put everything in context i actually think it makes like it makes a ton of sense because like after the top six guys and plus maybe like carson Wentz, even with him like who has a lot of stability no one right it's the rookie guy that just got picked first overall because he's going to have that rookie contract runway to kind of have that security blanket and I think he's a great buy in both cases. I'm paying that QB8 price. I'll take him over Josh Allen all day, every day, twice on Sundays. 
Um, and I'm definitely also willing to cop the buy button in redraft. So I think that's a great pick. It's a great late round QB uh, for super flex as your QB two. Uh, you know, it, it sounds risky, but, but I think it's, it's definitely a worthwhile investment and a play that you can make. Yeah, there aren't many safe – like, I know it's risky to say a safe pick is a rookie, but you just look at the, the game he brings to the table, the team he's on, the situation he's in. It is a very, very, very safe pick. So, if you have a high upside quarterback one, just pair it with Joe Burrow and then get, like, a Ryan Fitzpatrick, a Tyrod Taylor, extremely cheap later for your bye weeks. Yep. Uh, so, next up, you know it's not going to be a bunk bed breakdown episode unless we talk about the prodigal motherfucking son, Cam Akers. Okay? Cam Akers, I'm so – tired of their running back by committee talk at this point it's like guys man i got i mean i got fucking snake oil to sell you if you really think there's <laughs> going to be a running back by committee because it isn't um look i get it daryl henderson by no means is he a scrub he's, he's not a scrub right like when you can put up those types of numbers in college you're not a scrub although it seems like memphis is always creating these like crazy yeah, efficiency. when you play uconn like once or twice <laughs> a year your numbers get inflated pretty high yeah, but but let, let's just like let's just take a step back and look at this, right? Like Sean McVay has been in the offensive co- offensive coordinator or head coaching role since 2014, and in those years in 2014 with Alfred fucking Morris, he gave him 290 touches. The year after, at, when Alfred Morris was basically washed, he still got 213 touches, and then in 2016. Those touches dip. You know why? Because the starting running backs were like fucking Matt Kelly, dude. And like, what was like, Zach Stacy? Oh, no, that was before his time. <laughs> no, right? before his time. And all these <laughs> scrubs. But then what happened? When he got to LA Rams, he got Todd Gurley, who honestly, in my opinion, is very comparable to the style that Cam Akers is. Like a crazy burst. Uh, not, not crazy. Like Actually, Cam Akers is probably more elusive than Todd Gurley. But from an athletic standpoint and the way they burst and hit the edge, I find them to be very similar players, both very efficient in the passing game as well. But as soon as he got Todd Gurley, what do you do? 350 touches first year, right? Second year, 330 touches. The only reason why he didn't hit 350 is because Todd Gurley was injured during the last couple of weeks that year. Uh, they wanted to rest him for the Super Bowl. Um, and then last year when his knee was basically fucking dust, what did he get? Still 250 touches. Like, this is not a man who uses running back by committee. And it makes sense because he's a smart offensive mind that likes to disguise his offense, right? When Darrell Henderson is in there, what do you think people are going to do? Goff is going to fucking get murdered if Darrell Henderson is in there on like third down and stuff like that. It's going to take some time. You got to be patient with Cam Akers because like I said it from the very jump. I love Cam Akers, but he's still the most raw prospect. He has a lot to learn, right? And that offense is complex. But once he picks it up, there's not a fucking chance in hell that Darrell Henderson and Malcolm Jag Brown is going to like be on the field over Cam Akers. Like, guys, you guys need to stop it. Like, it's, it's July. It's August. We said it before. Coaches aren't going to come out this early and tell you that their entire veteran room is useless. That, that's not, that benefits nobody. You lose your vets. Just like how KC kept saying Damien's a guy. Just like how, you know, Colts are going to keep saying Marlon Mack's a guy. Like, they're going to say that because they need to. They need to keep their team apart. But actions speak louder than motherfucking words. And what did they do, man? The most gross mismanagement of a roster I've ever seen because with a plenty of holes on their offense and everywhere else, everywhere else what do they do in the second round? They drafted a fucking running back. Horrible. Horrible for their team, but great for fantasy. Click the buy button on Cam Makers, please. Noah, fucking tell them. Just tell them, man. Just tell them. This is, as Anna would say, it's simple. They draft Daryl Henderson in the third round, and common narrative is there's going to be a running back by committee in L.A. the following season, which would be 2019, because Todd Gurley's knee, as you said, was dust. Daryl Henderson, what did he have last year? Like four carries? Went for like four yards probably. The guy just wasn't good. Then they go out in the second round, and they take Cam Akers. You don't spend a third round pick on a running back, realize he's bad, says he's bad in that system, <laughs> then spend a second round pick on a running back who is basically better in every facet of the game. You want to say Daryl Henderson is faster? You can say that, but I'll look at the numbers and Cam Akers ran a faster 40 time at a heavier weight at a bigger stature. You don't go out and draft a more complete running back with more draft capital when you have other pressing needs if you think the incumbent running back is actually good at football I know you said you didn't want to disparage him Mike but I'm here to do just that because (laughs) Daryl Henderson in my opinion is not the guy like what is he better at than Cam Akers other than having a longer name like there's nothing there's no part of his game I'd feel more confident in saying Daryl Henderson is better than Cam Akers at and sure that might take a few weeks for it to sort itself out maybe they do start off 
with a running back by committee. But as you said, like all we've ever seen out of Sean McVay is him wanting to feed one guy. Todd Gurley last year with half of a kneecap, making Jamal Charles look like the healthiest son of a bitch on earth, had the fifth highest snap share in the entire NFL amongst running backs. 71.1% of the offensive snaps, Todd, or 71.1% of the time, Todd Gurley was on the field for the Los Angeles Rams, and he was not good at all. He scored 14 touchdowns on an extremely inefficient season. None of his touchdowns came from further than 13 yards out, which is ridiculous. Cam Akers has obviously the ability to score on the goal line and this ability to make some breakaway plays. So obviously 14 touchdowns is extremely high to expect out of Cam Akers in his rookie year, especially if he isn't given the backfield right away. But with his explosiveness, could he threaten double-digit double digit touchdowns? Of course he could. I mean, Todd Gurley had nine, the ninth most goal line carries with 12, the third most red zone carries with 51, and he was basically a running back one despite running into his center's ass half the time. So he is a younger version of Todd Gurley with explosiveness. He is an extremely raw runner, but I wouldn't – I don't think it's brash to say, like, his rawness isn't as bad as Todd Gurley's deadness was last year, and Todd Gurley was able to produce in that type of offense. So I do think the offense – offensive line isn't great but I don't think it's as bad as many people think they were 19th in adjusted line yards last year which isn't really good but you have to keep in mind they had three starters that started less than 10 games so it obviously hurts the offensive line when you have backups playing for five six seven games during the season it's not going to completely switch right they did lose Rod Roger Saffold which was a huge hindrance to their offensive line from 2018 to 2019 but if they're middle of the pack and Cam Akers takes those steps which we expect him to take uh, becoming a rookie in the NFL and just being as talented as he is, there is no reason for him to be the RB24. Like, he's going behind Dave Montgomery. He is just a souped up and actually athletic version of Dave Montgomery in a better offense, behind a better offensive line, with a better quarterback, with a better system. There is no reason to me why you should be taking Dave Montgomery ahead of Cam Akers. And if you want to see Daryl Henderson's a better pass catcher than Cam Akers, go right ahead. But Tariq Cohen's still taking the passing down work from David Montgomery for some reason. So there's there's absolutely zero reason. It's it's pretty disrespectful to us on Bunk Bed Breakdowns when we've been keeping up so hard for Cam Akers for people to still go out there and take David fucking Montgomery ahead of him in redraft leagues. <laughs> I feel, yeah, I feel... Look, I mean, maybe it's because Bunk Break Breakdown has not been supporting Redraft enough that the mistakes are this, like this are being made. But we are here for you now, and we are here to save you from your goddamn selves. Don't save her. She don't wanna be saved. Because I swear to God, if I see another fucking David Montgomery get drafted ahead of Cam Akers, <laughs> I might not wear pants next episode. All right? So, next up, I just tweeted about him, and I said I'm going to dig into this episode, and here we go. J.K. Dobbins, in my opinion, is going to be a league winner in 2020. That's fucking right. A league winner in 2020 in your redraft leagues. And the common narrative for J.K. Dobbins, I know this because I've said it. Noah said it. Look, 2020 is not his year, but he's hella talented. He landed in a great situation. Be patient. And in 2021, reap the rewards in Dynasty. I'm really starting to change my tune on this after digging into it and after thinking about it a lot more. I think he might be the best running back, rookie running back to target at his current price in redraft. He is currently going at pick 82 overall in round seven. So back part of the round seven. Positional ADP of RB30. RB30, okay? So he's also going behind David Montgomery. What the fuck is going on here, okay? <laughs> like he's RB30 in Dynasty. He's going 23rd overall. So his total pick is higher than his positional pick from dynasty to redraft i understand the long longevity i'm looking for and all that there should not be that big of a gap between dynasty and redraft and i covered this on the last market watch mondays but that is just too big of a goddamn gap that's 59 picks apart which is just is, is absolutely insane to me and that either means one of two things either his dynasty adp is super overvalued which i don't think it is or his redraft ADP is super undervalued, which I absolutely believe is the case. And here's why. Baltimore Ravens in 2020 have the fourth easiest strength of schedule in the entire NFL per Warren Sharp analysis, okay? They're projected for 11.5 wins. And guess what? This is why I say he's a league winner. From week 13 onwards, a.k.a. your fantasy football playoffs, they have the number one easiest strength of schedule in that time frame. 
what the hell does that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. Last Thank year you, in Mike, 2019. I think it means, I think it means something good, but I'll let you finish. But I think it means something good. <laughs> I think you're on to something, man, because <laughs> in 2019, the Baltimore Ravens in neutral game scripts, which means the game was within one position, one possession. They ran the ball at 54%. Number one in the NFL. The NFL average was 42%. So combine those things together. What do you get? They're going to be ahead in a lot of games, right? And when they're ahead, what do you think is going to happen? You think they're going to keep trotting out 30-year-old Mark fucking Ingram out there? Or are they going to give their second round pick, who they didn't need, but they took him because, and I quote, paraphrasing slightly, he was too fucking good to pass up. That's basically <laughs> what happened, okay? So given all of that, and on top of it, I'm going to give you a little bit of cherry. A little bit of cherry on top, okay? Mark Ingram was top three in the NFL in carries within five yards. What does that mean? That means they have a lot of scoring opportunities that are distributed to the running back position. And, you know, a lot of people quote red zone carries. I'm going to tell you right now, red zone carries don't fucking matter. What you want to look for is inside the five. The conversion rate, from inside 20 to inside 10 to inside five, like doubles and triples in terms of the likelihood of scoring as you get close to goal line. Obviously, right? Obviously. For people don't Unless you're Nick right. Chubb or Dave Montgomery. <laughs> Unless you're Nick Chubb, yeah. And he also had two targets within 10 and six targets within 20. So he was top three in the NFL. The only people that had more carries inside five than Mark Ingram last year was Christian McCaffrey and your boy, Joe Mixon. Shocking, I know. Uh, that one blew me away a little bit as well. L and, and the common narrative is also that Lamar Jackson steals a lot of red zone carries. Is that the case? No, it is not. Lamar Jackson only had five attempts inside five last year. And you know why? Because the Ravens aren't fucking stupid, right? Like they have a good O line. They have a good run game. There's no reason to put Lamar Jackson in that situation unless it's like a true scramble and go. So when they get into the red zone, which they do a lot because they go on it for it on fourth down a lot because it's the right move to make who gets the ball freaking running backs right so and the other thing is to tie this all together it's COVID right people are usually I think people are really scared of COVID I talked a little bit about this on the market watch Monday as well I'm actually of the opposite like I think that COVID is going to create more opportunities for rookie running backs not less because what happens if Mark Ingram gets put on the fucking COVID list this guy's 30 years old you think he's gonna come back within three weeks no hell no if he gets COVID Mark my words, he will not get that backfield back if J.K. Dobbins takes that dude. But even if he doesn't, Gus Edwards, him, Gus Edwards, the ultimate Jag, had like 700, what, 800 yards last year? You guys don't think like a second-round pick with the athleticism of J.K. Dobbins is going to have more than that? Come on, man. I posted on Twitter, and someone literally said – someone responded with – what did he say? He said, oh, J.K. Dobbins, you mean the guy in a five-headed running back by committee? I'm like, dude – do you guys just literally go to like the depth chart and count the running backs and think of how much of a committee that is? Like, this is not that fucking hard. And I, I hit him back when with Justice Hill was like actually a running back in the NFL. It was like one preseason, but he was actually a running back for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I just responded with like, Hey man, were you a Darwin Thompson truther? Cause that's, that's the kind of vibes I'm getting. And guess what? He was a Darwin Thompson truther. So <laughs> we can totally ignore that. But I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, I don't know about you, Noah. I know you've been rising on him as well, but just like the more I dig into it, the more I love him for Dynasty, for Redraft, for God, any goddamn format, I think he's going to be great for this year. Yeah, if you guys want to see our breakdown on J.K. Dobbins pre-draft, we literally, it's on the Bunk Bed Breakdowns YouTube channel. We literally said the only way we like J.K. Dobbins more than any of these other rookie running backs, if he falls in a situation with a good offensive line, and a mobile quarterback because we saw the dip from his freshman to a sophomore year and then the jump from his sophomore to his junior year because when he had Dwayne Haskins, he's not the most athletic guy and he suffered because their offensive line play kind of got a little decrease and he wasn't benefiting from RPOs with Dwayne Haskins on their center. What better landing spot could there have possibly been than the Baltimore Ravens with Lamar Jackson? And I know he's probably not going to start off too hot, so maybe you might be a little wary about the running back 30 overall draft capital for uh, redraft leagues but as Mike said right if COVID does hit and obviously we're not rooting for that to happen but if it does hit and a guy like Mark Ingram who's a little bit older takes time to bounce back from it J.K. Dobbins is not going to take his foot off the gas he's just a younger Mark Ingram Mark Ingram no disrespect to him he's still a fantastic running back but J.K. Dobbins is just a younger more athletic version of him pass catching wise I'd, I'd say it's about a toss up. Neither of them are going to get any sort of like pass catching duties, like stolen from the other guy. Like whoever's out there is probably just going to get the ball. They're not going to sub them out to get Jacob Dobbins on the field or vice versa. 
but the running ability that he has, like he can easily take over what Mark Ingram did last year if the unfortunate does happen to Mark Ingram. But as you were saying, like he's basically this year's Miles Sanders because we knew what Jordan Howard was last year. He was a one-dimensional type of in-between-the-tackles grinder, and J.K. Dobbins is a little bit more one-dimensional than what Miles Sanders is, but he was in a situation with a good offensive line on a team that if Jordan Howard went down would have been handed the keys to the castle. And that's exactly what happened. He was a league winner for you down the stretch last year. J.K. Dobbins has every ounce of potential that you could possibly muster up for a fantasy running back. The guy like ran for almost, I think he did top like 2000 yards last year at OSU against decent enough competition. I see no reason for him to not be a league winner down the stretch because if they are like 10 and two to whatever point in week 13 or uh, 11 and one, whatever it may be, like maybe they do scale back marking for the playoffs because last year he did break down. He had that calf injury. Maybe they scale him down. J.K. Dobbins starts to get a bigger workload. And with his number one easiest strength of schedule down the stretch and an offense where you only need like 10 to 12 carries to be a running back one, which is like what Mark Ingram averaged uh, per game last season, he's going to return value for you nine times out of 10. Do not be worried that over the first half of the season, he might not be the best investment for you. Running back 30, that is completely baked into his price. If you were to redraft your team at week eight and on, I would be confident in saying he's like a top 12 running back at that point. Yeah, the, the thing that like really, really blows my mind is like people love Kareem Hunt, right? People love Kareem Hunt. And they say, oh, what happens to Nick? What happens if like Nick Chubb, you know, like gets injured? What happens if, the, what happens if uh, Kareem Hunt takes over the goal line like, work? Like, dude, who is a bigger impediment to touches? Freaking Mark Ingram or Nick <laughs> Chubb? The best pure running back in the NFL. Like, it's not – like, fantasy doesn't have to be that hard. If you like Kareem Hunt, you should fucking love J.K. Dobbins. Like, you should absolutely love him. And I am really coming around on him, especially for redraft. And honestly, like, he might even shoot up my dynasty rankings a bit as well because the league-winning upside is there. Like, Price has the risk already baked in. Like, if you drafted properly in the top part of the draft and you got a couple stud running backs, you should be in a position – to be capitalizing on high upside guys like J.K. Dobbins, like Kareem Hunt, like Cam Akers, because you have those starters early on in the season. You can backfill with bets later on in the, in, the, in the draft, right? And, you know, people always quote like, you know, oh, Nick Chubb, you know, wouldn't have had like, you know, a thousand yards or whatever, you know, if he didn't, if uh, they didn't trade Carlos Hyde. Like, why do you think they traded Carlos Hyde? right? Like, why do you think they let these guys go on? Because they're really fucking good. They can get on the field and you should only be concerned the only thing I'm concerned with when I'm drafting these guys is points per game because I'm not dumb enough to start them week one, right? So, so quoting like season long stats is completely irrelevant to me. What I care about is in those weeks that I start him, how many points is he scoring for me? And if JK Dobbins is what we think he is, and if he gets an opportunity, like you're looking at Miles Sanders type of performance, like 17 points per game, like for the last six weeks when it matters most. And that is what a league winner does for you. So you can quote me like season long stats all see all day long. I just, just don't give a fuck because I'm looking for that high upside on a points per game basis down the stretch. And if we're talking about high upside players, kind of the antithesis of JK Dobbins, because I loved him pre-draft and my heart grew three times that day on April, whatever, when he got picked by the Philadelphia Eagles, Jalen Rager is just <sighs> wide receiver 51 off the board. Like I get it. You don't want to invest in a receiver during his rookie year. It is very nerve wracking and people are drawing parallels to Nelson Aguilar because he was also a first round pick and he didn't have the best hands in the world. I do not care about Jalen Rager's hands. The fact that he was catching quarter from quarterbacks that I couldn't even name their first or last name from. And when you watch them on tape, like the drops that he had was five yards slants when they were firing at his knees. Like I'm not going to excuse him for it, but let me just say if I was a wide receiver for like 15 years and you threw me out there, I'm not catching those passes either. You see the plays that he makes deep down the field, the hands that he has in contested situations. I have no doubt that he is a talented wide receiver. Them spending first round capital on him just proves that to me. And obviously there are a lot of busts in the first round and they don't always pan out. But the fact that at least by my eye test looked like a very good player and it was backed up by draft capital picked by a team that has shown like Miles Sanders had a big role in his rookie year. Why not give the same to Jalen Rager in a very thin wide receiver group? Like the stars just aligned for him. And the reason why I'm super high on him for a redraft in this position is he could realistically be like this year's AJ Brown. And of course that is extremely high, uh, an extremely lofty comparison, but heading into the year, who was drafting AJ Brown? I would bet 99% of you picked up, or if he was 
you, if you didn't pick him up, 99% of you saw A.J. Brown on your waiver wire after week one. Even at that point, you were hesitant to draft him because as athletic as he was, he was still – he had question marks around him because he had Marcus Mariota throwing on the ball. That is not the case for Jalen Rager. Carson Wentz is there. Carson Wentz fits Jalen Rager's skill set to a T. Philly had the ninth most pass attempts last year. Wentz was 10th in deep ball attempts. We know Jalen Rager has the requisite speed to win deep down the field. We know he has the vertical to win in the red zone and, you know, the quicks to win in the red zone as well. It's not always about how tall you are to win in the red zone. But Jalen Rager is just – if there's one word to describe him, it's – he's a dog, right? He's just an absolute animal. The fact that he did what he did at TCU proved that to me. But on top of that, it's like wide receiver 51, who are you going to pick instead? a Jamison Crowder type who's going to give you 65 receptions for 400 yards and one touchdown? Or do you want somebody with Jalen Rager who is low risk, extremely high reward because he gives you everything you want out of a high upside receiver. He has yards after catch ability. He's extremely dynamic with the ball in his hands. That's why he was returning punts for TCU. He has athleticism to break the plays that is needed for the yards after catch. He is going to be used in the deep game. We saw Deshaun Jackson in week one be an absolute menace, put up like 140 yards and two touchdowns before tearing both his hamstrings clean off the bone like some Kansas City barbecue. We saw that they want to use somebody deep down the field in that offense. Jalen Rager has the size, the speed, and everything you want to be used in that part of the game. And the fact that they really have nobody else to compete with him for targets other than the tight end position, but that doesn't even really matter because the average depth of target that Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard are going to see are nowhere near Jalen Rager. The only players that are going to challenge him for targets are guys like Deshaun Jackson and Alshon Jeffrey. And Alshon Jeffrey has played 23 games over the past two seasons. Djax has played 15 over the past two seasons. So they are not the perfect picture of health by any stretch of the imagination, especially with COVID going around and them being older guys. Again, we're not wishing this upon any player, but if it were to hit somebody at their age, it might take a little bit longer for them to recover. And I think Nick brought up and it fade the public or maybe on the Matt Kelly Roto Underworld podcast, he said something about Animal telling him, why not invest in rookie receivers? Because with COVID, they're probably going to have to step into a bigger role earlier because I'm not so sure if like chances like a 30-year-old is much higher than like a 24-year-old, but because of all the injuries and especially with Alshon Jeffrey and Deshaun Jackson who can't stay healthy, uh, he's going to have to step into a role early on. And even if he doesn't, right, he's just a guy who I believe over the second half of the season, the team is going to realize is way too good to keep him off the field. So in my opinion, he's just an extremely high upside player that gets high value targets in the red zone. Uh, deep down the field, tied to a quarterback that just fits his skill set to a T. Yeah, look, I mean, you guys, hopefully you guys saw us when we were live streaming uh, the draft, but Noah and I literally like jumped out of our chair and just like screamed in excitement. And by screamed, I mean, Noah maybe raised his voice like one octave because a student, I've never seen this guy <laughs> yell in my entire life. But look, I was pumped. I, I honestly said, we said before the draft, if Rager lands in Philly, he's the one that challenges C.D. Lamb for wide receiver one in Dynasty. Uh, and that carries over to rookie, right? Because, look, he's he's going as the wide receiver 51 in the 13th round. You know, you're basically throwing darts at handcuffs there. And there's only two rookie wide receivers that I'm kind of willing to throw the dice on. And at that price, Jalen Rager is one of them. You know, you heard a little bit of the news about how they're trying to like move him across the offense. And you kind of want, you like to hear that because what that means is like, they're probably going to get manufactured some touches. And when you manufacture a player as explosive as Jalen Rager, some touches, he's going to do good things with them. Right. And he's also paired with Carson Wentz who, you know, I don't want to get into the whole Dak versus Carson debate, but I think Carson Wentz is an above average quarterback in the NFL. And really that's all you need to produce. Um, they're in a tough division. Um, so, you know, they're probably going to be in some high scoring affairs. So that's kind of where you want to go with it. If, if you're going to draft a rookie wide receiver, you know, I think he's as good a pick as any, except for one guy, which we'll cover later. Um, so I look, I think the gap of 82 picks apart between dynasty and redraft is too big. I think the positional difference of 28 is too big. When you shoot for these later round wide receivers, you want guys who can hit like top 24 upside. So wide receiver two, like, I don't give a shit about someone that, you know, there's, I see a lot of people tout like wide receiver, like 50 to 60. And like, this guy's going to be huge value. He's going to finish as like wide receiver 36. Like, dude, nobody gives a fuck about wide receiver 36 <laughs> because wide receiver 36 isn't winning you anything. The only, all it takes to be a wide receiver 36 is to start 16 games and not be trash. Like that's it. You really want the guys that can provide you wide receiver two to wide receiver one points per game upside on a weekly basis. And I can see Rager providing that should he break out as we think he will. So that's why I think he's a good pick. Um, I mean, not much more said there. If you guys want to check out his detailed breakdown videos, we did one before the draft as well. He's Noah's dude. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just a, a, a 
innocent bystanding cheerleader that that supports Noah in his efforts uh, on these on this. You'll watch so. me catch a ton of arrows after this season <laughs> when he puts up like 200 yards. I'll just be sitting there like this, just getting freaking <laughs> railed. <laughs> you just be like, damn, I'm glad I didn't have him as my dynasty wide receiver. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Next up, uh, look. Sometimes as co-hosts, we don't agree on things. This is going to be one of those times. Noah put this dude on the list, and I respect Noah's opinions. I want to hear what you have to say about Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, just to give you the numbers real quick, he is going at pick 177, so in the 15th round. Wide receiver 61 compared to Dynasty, 110 overall, round 10, wide receiver 38. Way too fucking early in my opinion, but that's where he's going. So why do you think he's a good pick for redraft, Noah? All right, Mike, I'll frame it this way. He is, to me, a much better redraft pick than he is a dynasty pick. For dynasty, I'm not too high on Michael Pittman either. I don't think he necessarily has the ceiling of a lot of other rookie running or wide receivers. But for redraft, I do like his situation a little bit this year. Obviously, T.Y. Hilton just got put on like pop or like not able to playlist, whatever it was, because of his hamstring. We'll see how that plays out. Usually, those do linger because it's like soft tissue. I'm not a doctor. I only spent seven years in college, but I didn't get any degree. Did you hear I finally graduated? Yeah, in just a shade under a decade, too. All right. You know, a lot of people go to college for seven years. I know. They're called doctors. Uh, Michael Pittman is somebody that I kind of like for redraft this year as a late-round dart throw because he does offer a frame that, like, Philip Rivers is used to, right? Whether it's Mike Williams or Tyrell Williams or Vincent Jackson or Malcolm Floyd. Whoever it was, he loves throwing 50-yard bombs that half the time don't end up in the hands of his receiver, but he loves making those throws. And last year, Phillip Rivers was admittedly washed. He was terrible last season, but he still attempted the sixth most deep balls in the NFL. Obviously, the Indianapolis Colts aren't the same offensive system as the Los Angeles Chargers, and you can't really look at last year's numbers as any sort of like test to see how they're going to play this year because they had Jacoby Brissett, who was afraid to throw to anybody other than somebody two yards down the field, and they had Brian Hoyer, who I'm not so sure has much of an arm at all. So Phillip Rivers, I'm sure, is going to take plenty of deep throws to Michael Pittman, and if that's going to come with inconsistencies, I do believe it will. But you look at the way that this team is structured and the fact that they have absolutely nobody in terms of receiving targets to compete with him, aside from Paris Campbell, who did nothing in his rookie year. And if T.Y. Hilton even plays, like Chester Rogers, I think was like second on the team in targets. Fucking Eric Pascal, or I think that's the dude in the Zach Golden Pascal. State Warriors. Yeah, I wasn't like just naming basketball players. <laughs> uh, some Pascal guy led the team in targets last year. That should tell you all you need to know about the Indianapolis Colts weapons group. Eric Ebron is now gone. They signed Devin Funches last year for a lot of money. So that tells you that they do want like a prototypical X big bodied wide receiver in this offense. The fact that they spent early second round capital, Michael Pittman, and the fact that he's coming out as a senior and seems to be more the one of the more pro ready receivers leads me to believe that he's going to find his way into the field in at least three wide receiver sets. And the fact that they don't have any red zone weapons, like obviously being six, four doesn't make you a great red zone weapon. But when you only have to compete with Jack Doyle and a 5'10 T.Y. Hilton who's never been great in the red zone and Paris Campbell who's basically never played a snap in the NFL, you don't have to be the best red zone weapon to command red zone targets there. So the reason why I like Michael Pittman as wide receiver 61 overall, does he have wide receiver 24 overall upside? Maybe, but I think if he does, it's on the back of the fact that he's going to be used in the deep game, which picks up chunk yardage, and in the red zone game, which will give you obviously touchdowns here and there. So he might not be the most consistent player, but I think if, you know, halfway through the season, he's like the second or third best rookie wide receiver in the NFL to that point, just pure numbers wise, somebody's going to want to buy in on him and try to find like the next Juju Smith Schuster to be a league winner. And you can play off of trading. Obviously you don't draft players to trade them because if they don't hit, then you wasted a draft pick, but wide receiver 61 overall, again, to me at that price, it's really low risk and it could be high reward if he does develop a good rapport with Philip Rivers early on for dynasty though. The quarterback situation there is a mess. They drafted Jacob Easton. That guy's an absolute idiot. So I don't expect much too too much down the road from him. But year one, maybe year two, I do expect him to have decent enough seasons to return value. Can't believe you're disrespecting my boy Swag Kelly like that. All right, Swag Kelly is the future of the Indianapolis Colts. Y'all, Swag fucking Kelly's know. sleeping on somebody's couch. He doesn't even know the first Put name. Put some respect right on Swag Kelly's name. All right, he he. According to him, he's the fastest quarterback in the NFL. Yes, he's faster than Kyler Murray. Put that in the books. I don't know if you believe it. Don't fact check that. But he is the man. But look, the reason why I'm not high on Michael Pittman are the same reasons why I'm extremely high on Jonathan Taylor. We talked a little bit about strength of schedule. 
And the reason why that matters is because it really dictates game script. You know, when we talk about people talk about like run versus pass ratio, what matters most there is how far your team is in the lead. If you're in the lead, you run more. If you're behind, you pass more. That dictates it more than anything. Contrary to popular belief, any model, any prediction model is worth a goddamn thing is going to start at the top by looking at strength of schedule. And you know who has the easiest strength of schedule this year, Noah? I'll give you For one. What, guess. wide receivers? No, no. Strength of schedule, period. Just like easiest schedule to face as a team. The Colts. Yeah. Indianapolis Colts by a wide margin. Like if you look at Warren Sharp, by the way, Sharp Football Stats, one of the best sites in the world. Go fucking check that shit out. But Indianapolis Colts, number one to the number two Tennessee Titans is a massive gap. So I'm really, really expecting them to lean on the run game. They already did. They were bottom three in the league in pass percentage, pass to rush ratio, and game neutral scripts. And I don't expect that to change. In fact, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they took over as the number one this year, or at least very much on par with the Bravens um, in terms of their pass to run script. And I just don't think this is going to be a very high volume pass offense. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, somewhat representative of what we saw from like the Titans last year or the San Francisco 49ers, right? Like, You're calling Pittman the next AJ Brown or Debo Samuel? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the team level. I'm, I'll get to Pittman in a second, but starting from the team level, I just, I just don't think there's going to be that much volume to go around. And then when it comes to Pittman, like I'm just not that into him as a prospect. Like I think if you look at the way that he won in college, like he's like that prototype where I'm like, Dude, if this guy busts, like, I won't be shocked at all because he didn't really do anything until a senior year where he was, like, really big. He's really fast. He's a, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete, right? Like, everyone in the NFL is, but he was a phenomenal athlete even compared to other uh, – his peers. So – but in the NFL, here's the thing, man. Like, every quarterback – I mean, every cornerback is fast. Like, like most of the cornerbacks run, like, 4-4s, four 4-5s. Fours, four most of the cornerbacks are strong as – a fucking ox so i just don't expect him to be able to bully guys like he did in 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 uh, college and granted like everyone thinks he's like a great red zone weapon but that's not what i'm looking for as a rookie because like good luck trying to guess when he's going to score those touchdowns man it's just not a recipe for success and like to be honest with you like like i said i basically fade rookie wide receivers like always especially in the draft because even aj brown I guarantee you, like, most people that drafted him dropped him by, like, week two, week three because roster spots are just way, way too valuable early on in the season. So, for, for, my, for like, my general approach to rookie wide receivers, I basically just wait and see. I try and look at snap rates throughout the season. Whoever's getting the uptick in snaps, whoever's getting upticks in volume, that's who I'll take. And if that is Michael Pittman, then maybe I'll take a shot on him later. But he's just not someone I'm willing to invest in in the 15th round. Like, I think at that rate, I'm, I'm probably trying to shoot for, like, a high upside handcuff, like a running back, because by week one, week two, we'll know if someone's on COVID, and if that starter's on COVID, then boom, you have a starter, right? I'd rather swing my fences on picks like that, which is why I'm fading uh, Pittman in both redraft and dynasty. Now, one guy you're not fading, Mike, pronounce his name for us, because I love this name. LaVisca Chenault Jr. I mean, Noah put out – Arguably, I would say iconic, iconic video um, early on <laughs> in the season of, about LaVisca Chanel, uh, 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 basically edited by the god of all video editing, our boy Scott uh, BDG. So, look, that was one of the greatest videos. There are three things I love about LaVisca Chanel. First, his name. Second, his get the fuck off me attitude. And third, his film. You know how Snack says, if my aunt... That's a great New Jersey accent, Snack. ...had balls, she'd be my uncle? If my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle. Well, I'm saying if Cordero Patterson had hands, he'd be LaVisca Chanel. When you get the ball in Visca's hands, good things are bound to happen. He's built like Ulysses World and runs like Eddie Lacy when he hears Mr. Softy roll on by. Dangerous combo for any defense to try to handle. He has the frame and skill of a running back when he's in the open field, routinely making smaller DBs miss when trying to square him up. If I had a nickel for every time Chanel got taken down on first contact, I'd be shaking a can begging for somebody to please wrap this man up like a Trojan commercial. Even then, we know those things are only effective like 98% of the time. Visca is more 2% than your local gallon of milk. And uh, admittedly, I was not high on Visca as a prospect to start. But the more we dug into it, the more we dug into his landing spot with the Jacksonville Jaguars, the bigger fan I became. Because if you look back, just, just look back to last year, who are the typical, who were the wide receivers that produced, right? Like A.J. Brown, right? Debo Samuel. Uh, Terry McLaurin, like DK Metcalf, right? But what is the common ground between someone like AJ Brown and Debo Samuel, right? These are guys that really create after the catch, right? And they're guys who can, you know, create on their own. And I think that in Jacksonville, 
aside from DJ Chark, who was going to compete with LaVisca Chanel for targets, right? Like, no one. D.D. Westbrook. <laughs> yeah, D.D. D. Westbrook. Like, are, are there still D.D. Westbrook truthers out there? Because if there are, like, please, just just stop. Just stop. Get help. Because the Michael get Jordan help. gift. Get help. Get, get help, man. Just get help. Because D.D. Westbrook is trash, always has been, always will be. Um, LaVisca Chanel is going to be the second target there. Second option. And he fits so well with the young quarterback because what you're going to do is you're going to want to get the ball in his hands and watch him do the rest, right? He's going to take targets from Leonard Fournette. He's going to take targets from Chris Conley. He's basically going to take Diddy Westbrook's, uh, Westbrook's job. And what is his price right now? He's going as pick 235, round 18, wide receiver 76. So you probably don't even need to draft him. I think most redraft leagues are probably around 15, 16 rounds. Uh, my home redraft league is 18 rounds because I like to play uh, deeper rosters. But you probably don't have to draft them. But I want you to keep an eye on him. And if you have a deep league, definitely draft him in like the 16, 17, 18th round because I think he's really the type of guy that can create. And, you know, I forgot who it was that put out uh, some like EPA expected, uh, uh, expected value added um, on, on, some of these, uh, on some of these players. And they basically compared, you know, taking a running back and putting them as a wide receiver versus taking a wide receiver and putting them in the backfield, lined up as a running back, and which type of plays created the most value. Uh, and it turns out, like, it was the latter, right? Like, you know, people always talk about running backs being mismatches, but it's a way more of a mismatch when you put a wide receiver who can catch as well as LaVisca in the backfield. Like, I think there's just, like, so many great possibilities for him. And the coaching staff even came out and said, like, early on, like, hey, we're going to use this guy like a Swiss Army knife. And some people view that as a negative because it means they don't have a defined role for him. But I think that's where, like, LaVisca is going to really create for himself. And out of all the rookie wide receivers, I think the one that I'm most comfortable taking a shot on at his ADP is LaVisca Chanel. Mike, we did this exercise one time before. Let's see if you remember what it is. I'm going to read you three numbers. you got to tell me what it means. 90, 100, 101. 90, 100, 101. Are those like his yards or something from, from his value Those were the targets that Chris Conley, Leonard Fournette, and D.D. Westbrook oh, saw. Shit. They combined for 291 targets. And their yards per reception, Leonard Fournette was at 6.9. D.D. Westbrook was at 10.0. Chris Conley was actually decent last year. at 775 receiving yards somehow, but... I know yards perception isn't the most telling stat, but when you're D.D. Westbrook and you're used out of the slot and you're averaging 10.0 yards per reception, you are not the answer. You are the weakest link. LaVisca Chanel is somebody who, I told you before this, like I'm much higher on him in Dynasty than Redraft because all three of those guys, I think Conley as well, I know for sure D.D. Westbrook and Fournette are free agents after this year, so I don't see any reason for them to pay any of those guys any type of money, so that volume isn't going to completely funnel over to, uh, to LaVisca Chanel, but he has the skill set to see 100 targets as early as his second year in the league. But also, as you were saying, right, he's like a 17th round pick. You don't have to, like most redraft leagues end after like round 16. You're going to be able to get him off of waivers instead of investing in like a second defense or a second kicker if you still play with kickers. And he's the perfect upside play because just like A.J. Brown, and I know, again, this is a lofty comparison, but just like A.J. Brown, he doesn't need 120 targets to be a wide receiver too. He doesn't need 100 targets to be a wide receiver too. He is somebody who we saw at Colorado be a Swiss Army knife, be able to take a two-yard screen to the house because although he didn't run the best combine time, you have to take everything in context. He had like some core muscle injury. He was wearing a shirt that MC Hammer would feel jealous about. It was one of the most loose-fitting things I've ever seen, which makes no sense because you're at the combine and everybody's in spandex. But I realistically see this guy as like, high 4'4 type of athlete and at 6'3 like 227 pounds he is basically built like DK Metcalf runs and plays kind of like AJ Brown and in this offense we're going to be playing from behind in an offense that cannot run the ball with Jay Gruden who's going to want to throw the ball a little bit and spending as high draft capital as they did why not just go out there give Gardner Minshew the best weapons he can have at his disposal and see if he is the franchise quarterback and keep him on a cheap deal instead of going out and trading for a quarterback or spending a first-round pick on one next season. Why not have DJ Chark and LaVisca Chenault on your two wide receiver sets, give him everything that Gardner Minshew needs to succeed, to produce. And as you said, he's just, he's so talented. And I don't want to hype up the video that we made too much because I'm not, I'm not much of a cocky guy, but I'd be, I'd be lying to say if after I recorded that, I didn't move him up in my dynasty rankings. Like after seeing the highlights dubbed over the words that I wrote, it's just like, it was too good to be true. And I had to move him from like my dyna my rookie wide receiver four to he got injured to my wide receiver nine. And then he went back to like my wide receiver five. He's just like, he's too good to fade, put on any clip of him in his sophomore year. 
The guy played like nine games and had a thousand yards and like 80 something receptions. He is the definition of an electric factory. He will win you your league this season in redraft leagues. Yeah, and look, he, he's tied to Gardner Minshew. And, you know, interestingly enough, Jay Gruden, who knows what's going to happen after all these stories came out about how much how much of an asshole and prick that he is. But if you look back, oh, at, yeah. Jay, if you look back to Jay that. Gruden, 2016, right? Washington was top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So they were in the top 10 in game neutral pass rate at 61% compared to the league average of 58. And in 2017, that dipped. They became more middle of the pack. But if we dig in a little bit more to see why that was the case, it's because they had legitimately no receivers in 2017. Here were Washington. You also have to remember, like Alex Smith, he was there with him, and like Dwayne Haskins as well. Like, he hasn't had great quarterbacks recently after Kirk Cousins. Yeah, this was with Kirk Cousins. So w- when they had Kirk Cousins, they were high passing. But in the year they didn't, it was because Jameson Crowder was the leading top receiver. Look, when Jameson Crowder is your wide receiver one, you're just not going to pass that much because you're not that good. So that, that's a fact. But back in 2016, when they had like not even elite receivers, just like some decent ones like Sean Jackson and um, Pierre Garçon, like they were a very heavy pass team. And we know the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to be in negative game scripts because they basically sold off every piece of their defense like hotcakes. And look, they're, maybe they're tanking. Maybe they're giving Gardner Minshew a chance. We don't know. But that doesn't matter for you for going forward because what matters is in 2020, Gardner Minshew is getting a shot. Their defense is trash. They're going to be behind, and they're going to be throwing a ton. And a quarterback's best friend, a young quarterback's best friend, is someone who can create with the ball in his hand. And LaVisca is one of the best at doing that in this class. So comfortably draft him. If you don't want to draft him, just wait. Watch him on waivers. And once you see, like, more uptick in his snaps, uh, before he breaks out, I'm telling you, just pick him up and stash him on your roster because, you know, come later on in the season, he could be that nice wide receiver, too, for you. That wide receiver thought three slot on your team that can provide you weekly wide receiver two upside. It's going to be a beautiful thing. All right. The last one, this is how, you know, we're pivoting over and helping you guys in redraft because we would never talk about this in dynasty and it's goddamn defenses. Look, I hate defenses. I hate kickers even more, but in redraft, there's a place for them because I I do think there is some strategy involved with defenses. And I think the lock of this season is the Kansas City Chiefs. And Nick tweeted about it before, and I retweeted it because in all of my best balls this offseason, I basically have 100% ownership of Kansas City Chiefs because I think they're the best defense to own. But let's take a look at the, the three things. Like this, These are the things that I look for when I look for um, defenses to stream. Number one, their opponents, right? You need to find opponents with bad quarterback play. That's the key. Hey, Mike, just say who they played twice a year. <laughs> I want to hear you say the names. <laughs> Okay, here's here's who they play twice a year. Chargers. All right. So we got we got we got Ty God and Herbert. Broncos. Drew Locke. Need I say more? Raiders. Okay, these are the teams that they play twice a year. So they start off against Deshaun Watson, and that might actually look like a scary one, but honestly, I I don't think it is because when it comes to defense fantasy, so many sacks too. Yeah, it doesn't really matter how much they let the team score. It's more about the sacks and the turnovers. And the Kansas City Chiefs, nobody blitz more than the Kansas City Chiefs, right? Like that's that's all Steve Spagnolia, what the fuck his name is. That's all he does. He just he just does cover zero blitz. And then the reason why I can do that is because the offense scores so much that it always puts the other team in a bind in the, and there, it forces them to throw. So it makes it more predictable and it really benefits their defense. And after they added Honey Badger, you know, it really helped the secondary as well. Like Chiefs used to be known as like the pass funnel uh, defense. That really wasn't the case at all last year. And here's the schedule. Okay. After Deshaun Watson, it's Justin Herbert and Ty God, right? And then you have a tough one on Lamar Jackson. You'll fade that in week three. But then from then on, they play the Patriots at home. We don't know if Cam Newton's healthy or not. And if Cam Newton's not playing, Jared Stidham certainly ain't it. Then they play the Raiders at home. We know fourth down throw away Derek Carr ain't it. Like, that, that's just a fact. And then they play the Bills. We know Josh Allen is guaranteed to have a fumble and a pick that game. Then they play the Broncos. Drew Locke, guaranteed fumble, guaranteed interception. Then they play Sam Darnold, probably guaranteed six interceptions at home. And then they play Teddy Bridgewater at home. And then they play Raiders again. And then they play the Bucks. So we don't know what the O-line is for the Bucks. Maybe you fade that. I'm personally probably still going to play them. And then they play the Broncos at home again. And they play the Dolphins, right? You basically have your defense figured out for like nine weeks in the middle of the season. And they're going to be playing ahead. 
They're going to be blitzing a shitload. There's going to be a ton of sacks. It's just the perfect storm for a defense, and there's just no better way to have it. Like, I was confident last year was the Patriots because I looked at the schedule. I'm like, look, this is a no-brainer. You have to own this defense. This year, it's going to be the Kansas City Chiefs. And, you know, I put out a weekly tweet about my top streamers. I guarantee you from, like, weeks three onwards, Kansas City Chiefs is going to be my top defensive streamer for, like, nine weeks. I agree with you, Mike. It's just real tough for me. Like, Patrick Mahomes is living rent-free in my head for the next 12 years, so I can't give you too many props on you choosing the Chiefs defense. But that is an extremely easy schedule. When you blitz that much and you are able to turn turn over quarterbacks because – you're playing terrible quarterbacks and under pressure, they're not good. You're going to have a good fantasy defense. You don't have to be the best defense in real life to be the best defense in fantasy. And the Chiefs just seem to be a great pick from weeks like, what was it, weeks four through basically 15 after, uh, after what was that game, the Baltimore Ravens week three? Yep, yep, after the Ravens yeah. week three. I do like that pick. Uh, but again, it takes a lot out of me to not say the Chargers <laughs> are the best defense in the league. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe if they uh, maybe if they stay healthy. But uh, look, that's all we got for you guys. This week was the targets. Next week will be the fades, so make sure you tune in for that. Um, big news, we got the new BDG Dynasty ADP up. Make sure you check that out. Uh, I was Excel monkeying last week to get that up there. Again, just real money, paid ADP, about 26 leagues this month. Honestly, best data you have available. Make sure you check that out. And if, if you don't, make sure you cop the draft guy because I promise you it's worth it for that alone. I had multiple people. DM me on Twitter being like, Hey, like, thanks for putting that out because I have drafts coming up this week. And you know, we're just here glad to help you. If you have comments, drop below, engage with us. I promise you, we will try and get back to you. We still have low subscriber count. So Noah and I are managing that account and getting back to every one of you as we can. Um, and then aside from that, you know, become a Patreon, join the discord, play in the leagues. Noah's again, just behind the scenes, managing all those leagues for y'all. Make sure you're getting it up and, you know, playing the big dogs. And I think, we're going to be having redraft leagues, right? Coming yeah, up it soon. might only be for patrons. We haven't completely decided yet, but we might only be opening up redraft leagues, patrons where you can play against other people in BDG leagues. We have a third money uh, party host or third money host. So uh, your money isn't going to be in the hands of some frauds. You only have to have one year of commitment. People are asking me if you join a redraft league, if you have to do that same league over and over. No, it's just a one year commitment, a 16 week commitment. Even if there's like, well, however long the season is, you just stay there for one year. You play against people that are kind of like-minded and you get to see who the biggest of dogs are this season. Yeah, make sure you get on that. Get on everything we just said. Follow me, follow Noah, follow the Bunk Bed Breakdowns account. A lot of content coming your way. Make sure you tune in for the narrative. Make sure you tune in for Five Fact Fridays. And I'll be coming at you Monday with Market Watch Mondays, which I guess you would have seen before you left this video. So hopefully you enjoy it.